Yes, it does. And good morning. <laughs> so uh, Fred, Fred had an interesting statement. He said, once you're saved, you know, kind of all that stuff falls to the side and we're not working for our salvation anymore. But the reality is, and that's true, but the reality is we can fall back into religious snobbery. Religious snobbery. I got a question on the board here. Are you a religious snob? Are you a religious snob? Stana is not going to answer that for me because she'll say, yes, I am. But. Not anymore. Not anymore. Yay. Okay. What would you say, friend? Okay, good. I, uh, good, I, good. That's a very good question. What would be some characteristics of a religious snob? What do you think some might be? Yeah. Okay, maybe they think they're better than you. They come across as, you know, you're a big ignoramus and I don't have all the answers and you need to listen to me because you're going to go to hell if you don't. You know, maybe come across a little bit coarse like that. Pharisees. Like the Pharisees. Now, what were the Pharisees like? Dana said they're like the Pharisees. What were the Pharisees like? They, they, they were working their way. The Pharisees thought they knew it all. The Pharisees believed that they had all the answers and that you better listen to them. Right? How about um, being righteous? A religious snob, self righteous? Yeah, you sometimes. You probably heard the term holier than thou. Religious snobs might look down at their nose at people that don't dress the same way they do or talk the same way they do or go to the same church that they do. And we can fall into religious snobbery. And that is a, actually, it's a form of thinking that by my behavior, I'm going to please God because by your behavior, you're obviously not pleasing God. And so I'm better than you are. And most of us would not admit to being religious snobs. We probably don't think we are, but what about your neighbors? Well, so your neighbors like might think you're a snob, you know? No, How about not loving? I'm not sure if that's entirely true. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounded good. Loving. Christ loves you. Yeah, what's that? People don't talk to you, they're snobs. People don't talk to you, they're snobs. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you... If you're a religious snob, it's very possible you're not talking to those people over there because they don't measure up. I'm not going to waste my time talking to them. They're trash, you know. Um, or they, they're just, you're just not uh, and very lovely to people. Maybe you make snide remarks, you know. It comes across in your attitude. It comes across in your body language, you know. You're not, you're not um, open and honest. Well, the problem is that... We can become religious snobs if we're not careful. And Paul had to deal with religious snobs as part of his ministry. Now, the biggest group of religious snobs that he had to deal with, who do you think they were? The Jews? The Christians? Okay, that's, that's, a, that's an, a possibility. But I think there's probably a group that caused him more trouble than even wayward Christians did. He mentions them quite a bit, talks about them quite a bit. And it was the Jews. Not just the Jewish leaders, but the Jewish people in general, the people that were in the synagogues. Paul had to deal with some real snobs when he came to the Jewish people. And in the section we're going to look at in Romans today, starting in chapter 3, Paul is going to address that group of people because it was that group of people that had some real questions about what Paul was teaching. What was Paul teaching? Well, we just saw through the first two chapters of Romans that scripture and nature and history and God's revealed law, our own conscience, all demonstrate that all of us are lost sinners. Every one of us, Jew and Gentile alike. And we asked this before, how you feel about that assessment. Does that bother anybody that, that there's no credit given to us whatsoever for any of the good that we do? It's an honest assessment based on what Paul has already described. And some people that aren't believers might have a problem with that. And one of the groups that had a real problem with that was the Jewish people. 
the Jews would have found being lumped in with the Gentiles, the way Paul lumped them together, they would have found that particularly offensive in light of their 2,000-year history and relationship with God. Why might the Jewish reader of Paul's letter to the Romans find his lumping them with the Gentiles offensive? Why would they think they would have a different standing with God than other, that others did not have? What, what can we say about the Jewish history and people that might have made them a little bit uh, disturbed by Paul lumping them in with these Gentiles. Because remember, Paul said, doesn't matter, Jew or Gentile, we're all sinners. Doesn't make any difference at all. Being a Jew, being a Gentile, we're all in the same boat. What do you think, Vern? Number one, I can't. Pride. Pride? What would the Jews be proud about? Why did they have pride? They were God's chosen people. Okay. And they study the word, they memorize the word, they have okay. the word down. Okay, we have two really good reasons here why the Jews would not want to be lumped in with the Gentiles. Number one, they were God's chosen people. And they were told that over and over and over again by God. And they were. And they were chosen. Yes, they were. Were they chosen because they were so much better than everybody else? No. They weren't. Why did God choose him? Because he liked him. Because he liked him? Because he liked him? Just like others that he chose. Well, you know, it's interesting. In Deuteronomy, God says, I didn't choose you because you were better than everybody else. In fact, you're worse. That's what he told them. In Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy. They should have, and oftentimes they should have known that. He said, you're a stiff-necked and hard-hearted people. Well, he chose them before he made them. He did choose them before he made them. I mean, he chose them, he promised that to Abraham, and Abraham had not conceived the first one of them yet. That's right. <laughs> promised it. And, and so they were God's chosen people, not because they were better than everybody else, because God just chose them because he wanted to choose them. And, and Fred said it's because they had the Bible. They studied the scriptures. That's pretty important. God gave to us his word. Didn't do that to anybody else. And then Marvin mentioned the fact that they had Abraham as their father. Pretty important guy. He's like up there with Moses and, and Noah and Adam and, you know, people that God dealt directly with. Yeah. But they had Abraham as their father. I mean, that's pretty, pretty cool. They had the law. They had, what else did we say? Not the law, not the law, the covenant. They had the covenants. Yes. They had the covenants. They had circumcision. They had the Ten Commandments. They had the Ten Commandments. They had the law. To be Jewish was marked by the covenant of circumcision. Circumcision was the covenant of God's people with, with God. Okay. And it was a promised covenant that would go on forever. And they had other covenants. Marvin says there's other covenants. How about the covenant of giving them a land? And the promise, uh, the promise that his descendants would, would, would be incredibly numerous. And, That's right. And would, uh, but the promise of the Messiah. Yeah. Yeah. Messiah would come through your people. Yeah. Do you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And, uh, I mean, those are like some big promises. I just listed some here that we mentioned. They were God's chosen people. They were children of Abraham. They had God's visible presence in the glory what was that what was that all about the, the, shekinah, glory. the shekinah glory what's the shekinah glory what is that remember when they left egypt yeah, they had wow. a of fire. that's right yeah. Yeah. they had a pillar of fire mm -hmm. that was visibly lighting their way and keeping the Egyptians from attacking them. It was a barrier between the Egyptian army and the people as they fled. And then it was a cloud during the day which would cover the people as they were in the desert. And then when they built the tabernacle, this cloud, this glory came and settled over and in the tabernacle. They actually had the physical presence of God 
in a visible glory cloud called the Shekinah glory that not only filled the tabernacle, but when Solomon built the temple, that glory came and filled the temple so that the priests had to get out. They couldn't stand in the presence of the glory. They had this glory in the temple. Now, how long did it last there? Do you have any idea? It lasted from the time that they went in to the promised land and the glory was in the tabernacle until David built the temple and then, well, Solomon built it, David's plans and collected the materials. Solomon built the temple and the Shekinah glory entered the temple and it stayed there until the very end, just before Israel was exiled by the Babylonians. Hundreds of years, this visible glory and presence of God filled the temple. That's pretty amazing. And they had that. And then they had the promise of the Messiah, who would be God himself coming to be with them. They call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. And so they had that promise. How about the temple? That was a pretty impressive place that God gave to them. And then he gave them the land. Today, the land of Israel is pretty small, but you know how much land God actually gave the Jews? From the, the um, Euphrates River in the north, past Iraq, all the way down to, the, to Egypt, that whole area. A lot more than they have now. Very much. And then God spoke to them through the prophets. He actually sent people to speak for him, to them. And then they had the covenant. I mean, that's a lot to be proud of, right? That's a lot to just throw out and lump me with all these heathen idol worshipers. They didn't have any of this stuff. But that's what Paul was doing. He was saying, you're no better than them. You have all that. But when it comes to righteousness before God, you're all in the same boat. Now, you would think that they probably would have a reaction to that, and they did. But in Paul's day, that hadn't happened yet. The Jews still believed they were God's chosen people, and to lump them in with all of the Gentile heathen was really kind of offensive to them for all the reasons and many more that we discussed. And so Paul answers some questions in Romans chapter 3, the first um, few verses, that had probably arisen as he went around ministering and confronting Jewish audiences. These were arguments that he encountered regularly from Jewish um, encounters and were a result of their religious snobbery. And we talked about some religious snobbery today. Have you ever been guilty of it? I have. I want to ask you. So here's some questions that Paul asks. He says, what advantage then has the Jew? These are sort of rhetorical questions. He's asking them in the sense that he's sort of giving out these questions that somebody might ask and probably did. So if the Jews and the Gentiles are all in the same boat, the question is, what advantage then has a Jew or what profit is there of circumcision? Now you think about this. It's a legitimate question. God just spent 2,000 years dealing with the children of Israel, bringing them out of Egypt, giving them the law, opening up craters and people falling in when they, they disobeyed, fire from heaven, and then the blessings, and then the cursings, and all the interaction between God and His people throughout the centuries. That means nothing? That doesn't give us any advantage whatsoever? That's a legitimate question, isn't it? You would think it would give them some leg up. Yeah. But they wanted to know from Paul, well then what is going on? What advantage then do we have as Jewish people? Why did God even bother? If we all end up in the same boat anyway, what's the purpose? How would you answer God that? God used them as an example. Yeah. Use them as an example? Yeah. Okay. That would certainly be a legitimate response. Hey. You were dealing with God, and God was dealing with you, and we can all see the results of that dealing. And so, you know, every example, even a bad example, is a good example. Your, your uh, daily sacrifices ain't cutting the mustard. Yeah. yeah. You know, you go through all the sacrifices, and you end up crucifying your Messiah. Not so good. Exactly. Okay. All right. And like God said to them in Deuteronomy, you're a stiff neck, 
Yeah. What advantage does the Jew have? Well, the one that he, he could have said, we had God's promises. If we obeyed him, we would be blessed. And they were blessed during times of their, their lives. They were brought out of Egypt. They were given a land. They were, they were given, you know, the land of milk and honey. God said, if you will obey me and follow my words, you will have such blessing that you can't even contain it. And there were periods of time in the history of the Israelites where that was true. He said he would fight for them. Did he fight for them when they were against their enemies? Yeah, he did. There were things that God did that were amazing. But that's not any of the things that he pointed to, Paul, in saying, what advantage do you have? Notice his answer here in verse 2. He says, much in every way, chiefly because to the Jews, they were committed the oracles of God. What's the oracles of God? His rules, his ways, his word, his word, his uh, the Bible. Where'd that Bible come from? Came from the Jews. All of the writers of the New Testament, except for Luke, were Jewish. The Jewish nation gave us that, that book. God entrusted it to them to bring it to us. And Paul points that as an advantage. And of all the things Paul could have picked, he picked that one. So the next question, but well, what if our righteousness demonstrates the, uh, what if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God? So here's, here's what the Jews are saying to Paul now. Okay, so we haven't always been perfect. I got that, right? Got David sinning and we disobeyed as a nation. We got thrown into Babylon captivity because of our sin. Okay, but in doing all of that, we were the example, as, as Fred mentions, of God's mercy. Because even though we were terrible, God still forgives us. God still brought us back. God still redeemed us. God still sent his Messiah. So obviously, we are helping to demonstrate God's mercy and God's forgiveness. Isn't that a good thing? Isn't God unjust if he punishes us for that? We're being good by pointing out his mercy through our sin. It's not about you. <laughs> it's not, it's not about it's about you. It's about God, not you. <laughs> oh, Stan. Well, their point is how can God hold us accountable if our sin demonstrates God's mercy? How would you answer that question? You just said it. Say it again. It's not about you. It's not about us. Huh, you're right. It's about God. And he says that. Certainly not. How will God judge the world? If God grades on the curve, you know, if it's all sort of relative, well, the worse you are, the better my mercy and forgiveness becomes. And so I guess that's uh, brownie points in your favor. No, God does not judge on a curve. He has an absolute standard. And we should all go to hell. We should all go to hell. That's right. What's the absolute standard that God uses to measure righteousness? Okay. Jesus. Perfection. Himself, right? He's the ultimate, he's the ultimate arbiter of what's right and wrong. Jackie said it. And his righteousness is demonstrated both by his mercy and by his judgment, by his wrath, because his standards never change. And his righteousness is demonstrated in both mercy and in judgment. And so the last question is, is there any way we're better than the Gentiles? Okay, Paul, you answered all the questions that we might have had. We don't really have an advantage except the word of God. And there's so a few things in there. Um, you know, none of us are righteous. Um, even if I'm a big old giant sinner, it doesn't really do me any good if it shows God's mercy. Is there any way that we're better than the Gentiles? See, the reason they ask this question is because the Jews came to believe that they were better than everyone else and their righteousness because they had a special relationship with God. And they did. They had a special relationship. But why was that not equatable to personal righteousness just because they had a relationship, a national relationship with God. 
because it wasn't a personal relationship with God. Good job, Jackie. Because it wasn't a personal relationship, it was a corporate relationship. Why do people go to church that aren't saved? Because they think it's going to help them. Why do people carry a big Bible and live by rules and, and look down at their noses at other people and have religious snobbery because they think that somehow that group insurance policy is going to get them into heaven. But it's not. It has to be personal. And Paul says that. Not at all. We have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they're all under sin. Is there any advantage with being uh, at being righteous because you're part of a group or because you're part of a named church or you're part of something? Nope. I'm going to enter into a personal relationship with God, not a corporate relationship with God. And so when it comes to righteousness, you must enter into a, cor a personal relationship with God through His Son. Uh, the only group we're part of is this group right here. And Paul concludes chapter 3 in this section, um, verses 10 through 20, he says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is no one who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have dece practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's it. Is the knowledge of sin. And so Paul concludes this section by summing it all up. No place for religious snobbery, no place for group identification, no place for we're better than you, because we're all in the same boat. We all need a Savior.